Greetings, hi, hello, welcome. Today I thought it would be good to talk about one year later. So one year after having my ovarian cyst surgery, which ended up being an ovarian removal surgery. Um, in case you're new here, my name is Maddie. I am an almost 26 year old uh, living in Bozeman, Montana. And a year ago, not quite to the day that I'm filming it, but about a year ago, I'm actually more like 11 months ago when I'm filming this, I had surgery, it was a laparoscopy, and it was meant to just remove a cyst on my left ovary, and I ended up having the entire ovary as well as my left fallopian tube removed. And so I thought it would be good to film a follow-up video to that. At the time, I vlogged the experience a couple days post-op, or sorry, a couple days pre-op, the day of the surgery, um, and then a few days post-op. I stopped my vlog at around four days post-op and I never really followed up. I did little hints of it here and there throughout traditional vlogs, but I never did like a sit down, let's talk about it kind of video. So that's what we're doing today. So to provide context for the entire story, I'm gonna start at the very beginning. In March of 2023, I was having some really severe, what I thought was ovarian pain. It was really severe pain in my abdomen. It was on the right side, pretty low down. Based on talking with friends who have had ovarian cysts before, it felt to me like it could have been an ovarian cyst bursting. Um, and it, it like went away literally like as I was getting ready to be like, okay, I need to go to the ER. <laughs> um, I had like woken up with that pain and it was really bad. And then it kind of just like stopped out of nowhere. It went from really, really sharp pain to kind of this like dull soreness aching pain. Like as I was getting ready to be like, I need to go to the hospital. And so, I never really thought anything more about it. I never felt any more pain until December of 2023. And I ended up having a similar pain in what felt like the same area in the middle of the night and it woke me up. Um, it wasn't nearly as severe, but it was a similar kind of sharpness um, and it didn't last quite as long, but it did wake me up. I like had to shift positions a few times throughout the night. And then again, I had that kind of dull aching soreness for a few days. And that happened the week before I had my yearly physical scheduled. And so, oh, sorry, I messed up my timeline. All of this was happening in 2022. I forgot it's 2024. So March, 2022 had some pain. December, 2022 had some pain. Brought it up with my doctor at my yearly physical. And she was like, I'm concerned about that. Um, and here's why. And she like went through it all, whatever. I had an ultrasound the very same day. I was getting all of my care for this while I was in Colorado because it's where my PCP is, because it's where I'm originally from. I'm a student, it's a whole thing. And so I had an ultrasound that very same day. And in the ultrasound, they actually found some pretty large cysts on my left ovary. So I was having pain on the right side, but the left side was the one that was a little screwed up. And so what the tech and what the gynecologist or what my PCP basically broke it down for me saying, it's potential that my left ovary was flipping and the pain that I was feeling was actually the cutoff blood circulation to my ovary. It's called torsion, ovarian torsion. And that could have been the pain and it could have been just referred pain into the right side. Who knows why I was feeling pain on the right side. It was the left side that was all screwed up is basically what they said. So when I was on the phone with my doctor who had basically prescribed with the ultrasound. She was like, hey, just so you know, typically with cysts of this size, we do tend to see people having surgery to address them because of the risk of ovarian torsion and then losing the ovary from blood lo uh, loss of blood flow. I was like, okay, thank you so much. She referred me to a gynecologist. I extended my trip to Colorado by a day so I could go talk to this gynecologist, he said basically the exact same thing, except for the fact that he told me that the pain I was feeling was probably actually from gas bubbles in my intestines and not from my ovaries. And it doesn't actually make any sense at all that I was having it on the right side. And it was almost certainly gas bubbles. And that was really frustrating to me because I really don't think that I had gas pain in the exact same location with the exact same like pain sensation and everything. And I don't think it's a con coincidence that I was feeling that pain at the same time, basically a week after or a week before having this ultrasound that showed that there were issues with my ovaries. So I was pretty frustrated by that comment from that um, OBGYN. But 
he was basically like, I think a good thing to do would be to get an MRI and just to confirm like the sizes of everything to make sure they're still there. MRIs will also give you a better idea about whether something is benign or potentially cancerous. So I was like, okay. And so I went back to Montana. I ended up calling a gynecologist in Montana, got an appointment and I showed her all of the ultrasound pictures that I had. She also was like, yeah, I think we could, we should do an MRI. And she also had me do all these blood tests. So they were looking for tumor markers and my blood tests. Those all came back clear. The MRI made it seem like the cysts in my ovary were actually a little bit smaller than they looked after the, um, during the ultrasound, which was like, okay, cool. But she still was like, yeah, we should do surgery. And so all of this was happening in January with the OBGYN in Montana. And then I scheduled surgery for March and she wanted to do a laparoscopy and she wanted to do it in what's called the robot room here. And I, I truly don't know what that means, but it's basically like, instead of her operating the laparoscopy to be things like metal things that go into my body with her hands, I think it was like a robotic arm kind of thing doing things. And so she's controlling this robot that's doing everything. And that just meant she could get like better articulation with the uh, laparoscopy probes um, and there was a better chance of saving the ovary that way. That's why she wanted to do it that way. So surgery day comes around. I have the surgery. I end up actually losing the entire ovary, not just having the cysts removed. The cysts in the ovary were just so like intermingled that she had kind of taken the cyst away from the ovary and there was just like nothing left really of the ovary. It was just like mangled and not really salvageable. Um, and she also took out the fallopian tube with that ovary because that fallopian tube was like really inflamed and angry looking and all twisted and weird. And she also said that the left fallopian tube can take the egg from the right ovary. And sometimes the right fallopian tube takes the egg from the left ovary. And so removing that fallopian tube, even though I didn't have the left ovary anymore, would mean that I couldn't get an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that occurs outside of the uterus. And because of how mangled and messed up that fallopian tube, it was like a recipe for an ectopic pregnancy. And so she ended up taking that out with it. So I woke up from surgery. I talked with the nurse immediately. I was like, did I lose the ovary? And she was like, yes. And I was like, okay. And I kind of like fell back asleep and like the fentanyl in and out of consciousness kind of thing, whatever, all that happened. Um, the only thing about the incisions and stuff that was a little bit weird was that the largest one, she had to like make one of them longer to get the ovary out. Um, that one was oozing a little bit. So they had to put this like tegaderm kind of gauze patch on there. Other than that, I didn't have any sort of issues with my incision sites. I didn't get any, um, like infections or anything like that. Everything healed really quickly. They did internal stitches for the inside. Um, and then for the outside, they just pressed it together and glued it together so I didn't have to go and get any stitches out or anything like that. I had a follow-up appointment or my surgeon called me about th three days after the surgery happened. I had surgery on a Friday and I think she called me on a Monday um, and checked in with me and made sure everything was good. Everything was. Um, so I just had my normal follow-up appointment. I think it was about 10 days after the surgery or maybe it was two weeks. Following the surgery, I was put on a 10 pound weight carrying restriction. And the idea with that is to make sure you're not going to herniate your sutures. So you don't want to like strain your torso and stuff with weight and then tear apart the incisions on the inside. You don't want those stitches, those internal stitches to come undone because then you can get a hernia, which is when your intestines are kind of like poking out from the muscular wall on the inside and it's super painful and requires another surgery. So I was on a 10 pound carrying limit. When I went to my follow-up appointment, um, I was talking with her about like the pain and tenderness and everything. And she said that I needed to maintain that 10 pound weight limit for a full month. So she extended my carrying limit or my weight carrying limit thing for another two weeks. Um, and I think that was just because I was still having some tenderness and pain. And I guess if you're not having tenderness and pain by then, they would say go for it and just like get back at it as quickly as you want. I've talked to some folks who like recovered a lot quicker than I did. And I don't know. I don't know if I would just have a slower recovery than normal or if I just have lower pain tolerance. I have no idea, but I was fine just taking the month to fully recover. Oh, I will say also, I took the entire week after the procedure off of work. And some folks were really surprised by that too. I did do some like little computer work at home because I am a PhD student, but I wasn't doing anything like in the office or in the lab. 
Um, and I didn't do any laboratory experiments for about six weeks because when I do laboratory experiments, I'm moving around really heavy carboys of water that are about like, what is it, 20 liters, about 50 pounds, 50 to 80 pounds <laughs> just being moved around. And so that obviously wasn't gonna fly after surgery. Um, I will say also when she was doing the surgery, she saw that I did have some cysts on my right ovary. So she like went over and looked around at that. And then because of that, she did, because of that and the fact that I lost an ovary, I'm only 25, don't have any kids yet, yada yada. She um, sent me a referral to talk to a fertility specialist. So basically like a hormone fertility specialist. And so I had that appointment in May um, and I'm, kind of going to be jumping around a little bit and I'm sorry for that but I going into the surgery was on hormonal birth control and I remain on hormonal birth control and my OBGYN the one who did the surgery her name is Dr. Shana Long I 10 out of 10 recommend her in Bozeman she's lovely everyone at the Bozeman Health Women's Health Center I don't remember what it's actually called they're all great um but she told me that because I was on hormonal birth control the pill that I wasn't going to feel any big hormonal changes with losing the ovary. And basically what's going to end up happening is that most of my hormone production, like lady hormone production or whatever, is taken over by the birth control. This is what she's telling me. I don't know how much of this is actually true. It's taken over by the birth control. And so the ovary kind of just takes a backseat and like lets the birth control do its thing and is still producing hormones and stuff, but is like really chill, like not really producing hormones not allowing eggs to like mature and become follicles and blah, 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 and move through the fallopian tube, blah, blah, blah. And so she was like, you shouldn't really notice, you won't notice any big difference hormonally or anything like that. I will tell you right now that was wrong. <laughs> First of all, my periods have been just all over the place since then. Even before surgery, I will say, I've been on hormonal birth control since like, ugh, I don't know, like forever. <laughs> not quite 10 years but close to 10 years I think around eight years or so and almost never have my periods actually lined up with placebo week when you're taking like the sugar pills they have almost never lined up with that meaning I've never been able to manipulate that and like skip a period when going on vacation because I almost always had my period like in the middle of the hormone pack and then like placebo week would happen and I might have another period or probably nothing and then also um at least for the past like few years of life periods have been my periods have been very very light like honestly could use like three tampons for an entire period they last like two three days that's it we're good to go very minor in terms of like any symptoms uh, like bloating cramping things like that didn't really get them ever since I have had this surgery my hormones I felt like were all over the place I felt literally crazy I felt very um like I don't want to say like I felt very emotional but I mean like I would feel emotions that f seemed based on the experiences that I was having like they came out of nowhere and I was having much more heightened responses to things and I was feeling much more irritable and all of that for maybe two or three months. I'll say like three months after. I remember I started um, therapy in I think May or June and I remember talking with my therapist and I was just like, I feel kind of crazy. And so my, my surgery was in the end of March so that would kind of line up like three, I'll say three or four months. I felt a little bit just like crazy, like very, very emotional, very responsive to things and very emotionally up and down like roller coaster very quick changes in emotion and then back going back to my periods since I had lost the ovary um they've been all over the place so the first one I had my period like the day after surgery is when it started it was really great timing um that one was really really heavy I'm attributing that to the fact that I had things put into my body and like anesthesia does weird things and stuff like that and that's the other thing like it's hard to tell with some of these if it's side effects from anesthesia or the hormones or like what because anesthesia does wild things to your body for an extended period of time I went through some really hard um what is that called insomnia <laughs> a few weeks after the surgery that's a whole other topic for a whole other video maybe I could talk about that at some point um but yeah with my periods I had a really heavy one right after surgery and then I think I had another one that was like kind of normal-ish like heavier than normal but it was like a normal timing like 28-ish days like a month or so and then I think I went like 70 or 80 days without a period 
which was like fine by me but also I was like weirdly paranoid I was pregnant despite the fact that I'm like on birth control and everything so then I started having to buy like pregnancy tests and like take one every now and then just because you like I don't know you just get a little paranoid every woman in their life has thought that they've been pregnant despite it literally not being possible <laughs> and I that's a shared experience that my friends and I all share. But anyway, um, so then they're, they're just all over the place and they had just started lining back up with placebo week for like, honestly, the first time in my life. And then this month they were like, ha ha, JK, we're going to go in the middle of the birth control pack, which is back to my normal, but it was like kind of annoying because I was getting used to the timing. And then all of a sudden I skipped a period and it ended up being six weeks instead of four weeks between periods. And so still kind of all over the place with that. What's more annoying to me is that I had way heavier periods for the first like eight or so months after surgery. Now they've kind of lightened up a little bit again. And now I get migraines with my periods. I get really bad headaches bordering on migraines. It kind of depends on the, the week. Um, usually on like day one and two, pretty horrible, like right behind the eye, hard to look out of the eye, like bright lights are really hard for me, stuff like that. I'm not getting too much cramping, but I have noticed like I never got lower back pain. People always talked about lower back pain with periods and I was like, I do not get that. Now I do. I get lower back pain and I get headaches and really bad headaches. And I was like, this is such bullshit because I went from having the world's chillest period and then you get rid of an ovary and now I'm having all of these issues. And that was really frustrating. So it's been kind of hard like coping with that because... I don't know, like, I just got like used, to, I got used to the way that my body worked for like the 15 years or however many years, I can't, I, how old am I, when my periods are, I don't remember, but I got used to that being the, the way that it had been for over 10 years and then now all of a sudden things are different because I lost an ovary in surgery, so that sucks. One other thing that I forgot to mention in this video, this is editing Maddie by the way, is that my acne has been a little bit more out of hand than before the surgery, especially around my period. Most of my acne that I get is in the chin jawline area, which is pretty typical for hormonal acne. So I've been trying to figure out what to do about that. Maybe going to be switching up skincare routine a little bit. I don't know, but that is another big thing that I've noticed uh, as a difference. That and my periods are probably the biggest differences and the most annoying. Um. So then cycling back to everything, because I am only, at the time I was only 24, 5, 25, I am still only 25, about to turn 26, haven't had any kids yet, I lost half of my eggs. So my doctor told me to go talk to this fertility specialist. I'm not sure if I want to have kids. I always have leaned towards no, but you know, I'm a gal who likes to keep my options open and not being able to have kids because my body would be a little bit of a bummer. Um, so I went with and went and talked with her, especially since I was having, I do have cysts that appear on my right ovary. And so basically I went to this woman, she's a fertility specialist. Her job is to get people pregnant. She was very, very pushy about like, she knows I'm a PhD student. She's like, women need to stop putting off having babies for their careers and for school, your body. And like, biology is all designed to have babies in your 20s like she was like I would prefer to work with four eggs from someone who's 25 compared to 20 eggs from someone who's 32 and like stuff like that so she was like really pushy about me and basically deciding if I wanted to have kids and she's like if you get into your late 20s and you don't know if you want to have kids and, and you still don't know if you want to have kids you need to freeze your eggs especially since I have half the eggs that a normal woman around my age would. Um, and so that was kind of eye-opening. And then also she told me that as long as I am not actively wanting to have kids, as long as I'm not actively trying to get pregnant, I need to remain on hormonal birth control. And that is to preserve my ovary because at this point, I've lost half of my eggs and so being on hormonal birth control it means that I'm not losing eggs like they're still in my ovary I'm not losing them every month needlessly to just have a period if I'm not trying to get pregnant and also because 
hormonal birth control takes over hormonal production of the ovaries a little bit, they can kind of like take a step back. And so it's not producing these hormones. It's not doing all this cell turnover. And so the chances of cysts occurring is lower because the ovary is just kind of like having a lazy Sunday rather than a very productive Monday, if that makes sense. And mistakes and weird cell things are much more likely to happen if they're trying to be really productive. The other things that I was told was that I am almost certainly going to go through early menopause, which is, uh, I don't know, whatever, I guess. I don't know. Maybe by the time I go through menopause, they will have figured some of the shit out and have developed better medications for women. Um, fingers crossed. But yeah, I will be going through early menopause. I have to stay on hormonal birth control basically always, which sucks a little bit. I've actually, it was really funny too, because I was actually toying with the idea of getting off of hormonal birth control because I just like, I don't know what my, I've been on it for so long. It's like, how would I exist in this world without it? I'm curious. Like, would I feel different mentally, physically, emotionally? Like, I don't know. So anyway, that kind of took away that decision. Oh, and then she told me with the cysts that are on my right ovary, she was like, absolutely do not let anyone tell you that you need to have a surgery on your ovary at Nino unless it is me or someone else harvesting eggs. And I was like, okay. <laughs> And then she also told me that if I am continuing to have issues with cysts, like if I do have a cyst that does burst or something like that, and if I have a really sharp pain again, um, first of all, if I ever have a really sharp pain in my ovary like that again, I need to book it to the ER and tell them exactly what they think is happening. And then also, yeah, no surgeries on it. And if I continue to have issues with cysts, which I don't know if I have or not, I can't tell. Um, that I need to increase the dosage of my hormonal birth control. Like make it more hormony instead of less hormony because I think I'm on a pretty low dose, like as low as I possibly can. Um, yeah. So I think that about covers it. The thing that has been, what's interesting is like I honestly don't think about it very frequently um, I'll show you, I'll put in some footage of what my um, scars look like if that is a concern for you. If you are having this surgery or you have had the surgery, I will say I've done literally zero effort to, <laughs> to like minimize the appearance of these scars. I think I have put lotion on them maybe 10 times since I had surgery almost a year ago. And I know that there's like scar creams and stuff that you can put on. Honestly, I just don't give a shit. I do not care. The sight of the scars does not bother me. They're not that big. I also haven't really exposed them to the sun. I think I've been outside in the sun in a swimsuit maybe three times since the surgery. And I think only like one or two of the times I've not been wearing a shirt because like usually it's because I'm floating on a river and I'm wearing a sun shirt because I don't want to get sunburned. Um, but yeah, so the, the scars are there. My belly button, at one point, I thought they had misaligned it and glued it together. Misaligned. It is not misaligned. It is properly aligned. So my belly button still looks basically the same way it did. Um, oh, in terms of other things that I notice, sometimes if I am like working overhead with like a weight, I only mostly notice this when I'm like taking my luggage in and out of the overhead bin on an airplane. Sometimes I can feel like this uncomfortable pulling sensation on the incisions. And what I'm guessing it is, is scar tissue that has like adhered to the muscles or scar tissue like within the muscles. And so there's sometimes this like uncomfortable pulling sensation. Um, but it's literally only when I'm working with weight like above my head and kind of like stretched out my body. Um, in terms of strength in my abdomen and core, I think I recovered it um, pretty well. I wouldn't say I've ever had a super strong core. I have a, a screwed up tailbone, so I have a really hard time doing stuff like sit-ups and like boat pose and lemon squeezers and all these things that people say you should do for your core. And so I've always had a weak core because of that. And then with the surgery and everything, I got pretty weak core, but I think it's come back. Um, in terms of exercising and stuff, I went back to really light yoga after about a month. And then I started doing more intense yoga maybe six weeks or eight weeks after. What's kind of tricky is I had this surgery. <laughs> the day after I had this surgery, we got like three and a half feet of snow in Bozeman. And so there was a bunch of snow and ice everywhere. And so I was really paranoid about like going for walks and stuff like that because I was really afraid of falling on the ice, falling and like busting open my incisions. So I probably could have recovered quicker if I were a little bit more active, like outside and just going for walks. I lived in a tiny apartment. Just walking around the apartment got really 
really tiring. Um, but I didn't want to fall on the ice. And so my recovery physically, I think, was a little bit slower potentially because of that. Um, yeah. I think that is everything that I want to cover. Let me know down below in the comments if you have any questions that I haven't answered. I've gotten so many comments on my other video, my surgery vlog, about how helpful it was to see this video before a bunch of other women have gotten the surgery and just to like know what to prepare for, know what to expect. And that is exactly why I make videos about literally anything is I guess a little bit of entertainment and hopefully someone out there can find something helpful or some good advice or insight or anything, or is just looking for someone to relate to and commiserate with. Um, losing an ovary it's it's like not it's not a it's not a small deal but it isn't the end of the world either um yeah i will say i've never thought more about whether or not i've wanted to have kids in my life than the like three months after surgery um and i still don't know where i stand on that but it is something that i kind of think about a little bit more like i i gotta I gotta get on that decision a little bit faster than the average person probably does but that's, that's the biggest thing right now in my life that affects it. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. If you or your loved one or someone you know is having the surgery, has had the surgery, has lost an ovary, whatever, um, I wish you the best and you're not alone and I'll see you in the next one.